Well, you've given me two absolutely excellent segues to the detective's assistant. <laughs> Obviously, my next question for you is, Kate Hannigan, have you ever seen a flying saucer, and do you believe in them? <laughs> <laughs> I do believe. Have not. Usually there's a reason. But um, why couldn't there be life out there? I feel like it's awfully egocentric <laughs> to think we're the only ones. So... Was there a possibility we might see some Foo Fighters uh, in the uh, coming sequels to Cape? <laughs> I can't make any promises, but... <laughs> I'm telling you, history gets really interesting when you add flying saucers. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> okay, well, let's, let's, let's do talk about the detective's assistant. Uh, so once I'm in, I'm going to ask you to give a uh, esteemed audience just kind of an overview of what is this book about. And I think the first time you asked me to do that, I just rambled for five solid minutes. So I'll keep this short. So um, holding up the cover of the detective's assistant, um, it is about 11-year-old girl dumped on the doorstep of her aunt's uh, home or boarding house. And the aunt turns out to be Kate Warren, America's first woman detective. She was hired by the Pinkertons in 1856. She walked into Alan Pinkerton's office for a job and he assumed she was there for a secretary position, but she used a great word. Another example of using a really good word. She said, I can worm out the secrets from the wives and girlfriends of the crooks and criminals. And Alan Pinkerton said, I'm a progressive man. We live in a progressive time. And he hired her and she became one of his finest detectives. So he wrote about her and another detective named Timothy Webster as his two finest detectives. And um, I was working on a totally other story when I came across that little nugget about Pinkerton saying how he hired her in 1856. I had a, another historical story set in, 19, in 1856 and I dumped it and I wrote detective's assistant like a pack of wolves were on my heels because I realized, oh my God, she's awesome. And if I found her, I might not be alone. And sure enough, there's a, a few other Kate Warren books out right now, but um, it was so stinking fun. <laughs> Because she was awesome. So various things, and I won't do the whole brain dump on you now, but nobody knew of her. Like I asked a bunch of my friends, have you ever heard of Kate Warren? No. And so as I dug up, there wasn't a lot of history. There's no history of her before she walked into Alan Pinkerton's office. So as a fiction writer, that's awesome. Um, but a lot of historians wrote her off. She was dismissed despite having thwarted a plot to assassinate Abraham Lincoln, she was not even a historical asterisk. She was just gone from the history. So as I read a bunch of biography, you know, historical writing, most of the historians said the same thing. She must have been Pinkerton's lover. And I was like, I've seen a picture of Pinkerton. Why? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like a little doubting of this. And so the big explanation I could find is the historians would say she must be his lover because she's buried near him in Chicago's Graceland Cemetery. So I was like, I'm in Chicago. I can go to Graceland Cemetery. I'll go look for myself. And I get there and there's this great obelisk to Pinkerton and his family and his wife and his kids and everybody's buried around there. And then off to the right are some beautiful old moss covered tombstones. And Kate Warren is there but also Timothy Webster and also George Bangs and, and all some of his other op operatives. And I thought, well, they can't all be his lover, can they? <laughs> so we make that assumption. So I, so then I thought- I never know. Pinkerton might've been a particularly prolific fellow as they say. He's a PI guy. <laughs> so if you, if you work from the assumption that maybe she wasn't his lover and maybe she was just this detective but at the time I, I think when you look back on things historically you can see it's just a lack of imagination you know before Obama was elected most people would say America can't have a black president just like we might say now America can't have a gay president America can't have a woman president like it's just a lack of imagination that it could ever happen um oh I don't I, think we're gonna have presidents anymore but that's just me <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we're, we were about going to have to wind down this experiment, try another form, but that's yes. moving away from history. That's, that's, <laughs> a, that's a later discussion. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So I just thought, well, what if we actually thought of her as maybe she was a good detective the way Pinkerton wrote that she was. So all Pinkerton's accounts of her helping with these cases 
were written with great esteem. Like she, he, he thought of her so highly that she was the head of his female force. He began hiring other women and put her in charge. She helped thwart, there were two people that rode the train bringing Lincoln through Baltimore. Alan Pinkerton and Kate Warren. And then she had to get off the train in Baltimore because they thought the decorum of the day, it would have been unsavory to have the president arrive in DC in a, the company of a woman that wasn't his wife. So she did have to get off, off there. But um, so I just thought, well, what if we look at her through the eyes of maybe she was a respectable <laughs> detective who was smart and competent and people just were flipping out that she was a woman. So. I wrote this with the idea that um, this girl, Nell, is 11. She gets dumped on Kate Warren's doorstep. And, and I just set up a train wreck of Kate Warren has this great job. The first time, you know, a woman doing a man's job in a man's world. The last thing she wants is a kid. You know, and the kid, I just killed off everybody in her family. So she, all she's got is Kate Warren and all she wants is a sense of belonging. And so the train wreck is set up. So it was really fun to write. It was really fun to write. So that's what that's about. You keep from pulling your hair out sometimes when you read these these uh, idiot historians. Oh my God, a woman must have been related to a man somehow. Yeah, that's just the way it's been viewed, and it is kind of amusing because one of these, I think, I'm looking just past the computer to a shelf, and I think I I have the guy. Maybe I trashed it, but uh, one historian, fairly recent, wrote about the Pinkerton. You know, all the research around the Baltimore plot is what it's called. So it's the attempt to kill Lincoln on his way to his inauguration to start off the presidency. It's it's not 1865, it's 1861. And one historian wrote about, so Pinkerton had a code name for the big moment when they escort Lincoln. And so Pinkerton's name was uh, Plums, was his code name. Lincoln was nuts and uh, Kate Warren was Mrs. Barley. So she, in a lot of the reports on the case, there's an, uh, you know, it'll say the account, like a detail of the account, and it'll be credited to MB. MB was Mrs. Barley. And one of the historians was like, and I had seen it verified elsewhere, but in this historian's account, he said, we'll never know who MB was. And I'm like, it's the chick. It's the chick. You're just not thinking of her. <laughs> so I like that they have to have a code name if there's only one woman. <laughs> I would think right. that, that would be decipher. Who would they confuse it with? So, so it was it was a thrill to research. I would still be on it if I could. Uh, in my mind, I was thinking that that was book one leading up to Lincoln's inauguration. Book two was the war, and book three was assassination. But my editor was like, "Meh, I don't like series. I just like a one-off." And I was like, "What?" <laughs> so, well, it's worked out. It's uh, the book is is beloved. If, if we can say that, uh, uh, it's won multiple awards. It's uh, but yeah. graced many most bestseller list. In fact, that was a question I wanted to make sure I asked you about. Uh, is when Jennifer uh, was here last episode, uh, we asked her what her experience was like of uh, the detective's assistant winning the Golden Kite Award and and all of the other prestige that it that it's garnered. Uh, what is your experience? What's what's the <laughs> author's pr perspective on that? Let us live vicariously through you. Oh, my goodness. So, OK, anybody who watches the Academy Awards, come on, like we all have our, our little speech. Like I would never forget to thank my spouse or whatever. Um, those moments I have low expectation. Like generally my life policy is, you know, don't bring shame to the family. Um, but so the book came out. I agonized over whether critics were going to say adheres too closely to Pinkerton's accounts and is boring versus people saying, plays around too much with history is not worth reading. You know, like I was ah, agonizing with it. And then um, I think this must have been 2016 when I got the call or something, but it was election time and we we're getting a lot of robo calls and different, you know, campaign calls. And my son took the call and he almost hung up on them when the committee called, like you get that great phone call. The committee calls to say, you've won. So my son gets on the phone and I think he's given them the bums rush to get off. Like this must be a political call. And finally they get through to my son to say, go get your mom. <laughs> so, so when I heard it, I, it took me a minute. Cause I'm thinking, is this like a Hillary Clinton campaign call? Or is this a, what is this? What, what am I getting here? So, um, so it was a thrill and everybody in life wants validation, you know, so that, that was a, a, a little bit of a shot in the arm to say, 
keep at it, you know, and that's, and that's what made me think I love this idea of digging up people from history and kind of shining a new light on them. Um, so it was this thrill. <laughs> was now that when you're, when you're facing the blank page um, and you remember that, Hey, I'm 2016's golden kite award winner. <laughs> well, I will say, you know, those eight years, you know how it is when you're plugging away and plugging away and you go to a dinner party and somebody says, Oh, and what do you do? And you say, well, I'm a writer. What have you written that I would know? Nothing. <laughs> you know, uh. So now at least I think there's a Wikipedia entry that says Golden Kite Awards, you know, and it has. So it's a little less excruciating at dinner parties. <laughs> so. Ah, now these days I just say I'm a podcaster and people go, hmm, and then they walk away. That's yeah, the end of the conversation. Yeah, podcast is, right? <laughs> Hi, internet. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Keep them guessing. Always throw them off. We are rapidly running out of time, unfortunately, because I I talked to you all day. Oh, this Uh, was great. I definitely want to ask you about uh, movie options for the detective's assistant. Uh, I know that I think you said that it's been about, you've been contacted three times. So what's that experience? And how soon can we all look forward to seeing the detectives? Man, oh, man, oh, man. So many things going through my mind. So Number one, I have heard many times that producers do not want period pieces because they're expensive to do all that costuming and trains from the 1860s and things like that. But just the other day, I saw the ad for Little Women with all the like star studded, you know, Emma Watson and everybody's in that thing. And I was looking at that and I'm like, oh, that's World War II era. So I'm hoping, not World War II, excuse me, Civil War era. So I'm hoping we're going to see like, a resurgence of World War II historical pieces, and then we'll be off and running. But um, I saw that trailer, and I was like, oh, thank God, finally a film version of Little Women. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's like it like five minutes ago. Didn't we just have somebody do that? But then uh, I said Meryl Streep, but I said, okay, fine, take my money. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That was it, too. I'm all over Big Little Lies for the same reason. I'm like, what's Meryl doing? I'm there. Um, so right after the detective's assistant came out in April... 15, I think, um, I got contacted by a producer in Chicago who had made movies and said he'd come across the detective's assistant ages ago, loved it, and let's do this thing. And so I like went with him and, you know, for a little while we did like a year long dance. And, um, and then Johnny Depp, this was a thrill, uh, Johnny Depp's production company, uh, somebody got in touch with me from that. And, and I remember like the email came across and he's like, you know, I read the detective's assistant. I'm really interested in doing something. Can we talk? And I remember taking the email to my husband and showing him my phone and saying, am I being punked? Like, is this, this has got to be like my brother or my sister. Someone is punking me. Is this somebody from the production company or is this Johnny yeah, Depp? That was from Johnny Depp's production company. Oh. And so I was actually going out to, uh, so here's my sticker. I was going out to LA to um, collect my sticker and collect the award at SCBWI for the Golden Kite. And um, and so they said, come by the you know studio. And it was top secret. Like it was a nondescript building in the back, no numbers on the building. We just had to deduce where it was and we wandered upstairs. So anyway, we found it. So this is before everything shut down. Johnny Depp his life changed and he cut the production company, but he'd made, um, he'd made a lot of movies. I think he did um, Hugo Cabret. Like he likes, I, they were readers. Like I, I saw, they, I got to tour the place and there was an entire room full of bookshelves, kid lit, adult lit. I mean, they were readers. And so I got to sit at a table with Johnny Depp's sister who looks just like Johnny Depp. And um, you know, a couple people who had read the book and they were like, let's talk. And I was like, it was such an out-of-body experience. If you can imagine that happening to you, that is exactly how I was. I just sort of stared dumbfoundedly at everyone who sort of, you know, mentally was up in the corner of the room watching down at the large wood table where it was happening. But, um, and then, you know, that production t- company was shut down. And then just recently I got um, another cold call random. I was looking at Facebook, like the night af- the night of my kid's graduation from eighth grade. We all came home after dinner and we're all just, Vegging, so I pick up my phone and I look at Facebook and some, you know, and you get friend requests. I got a friend request from this person, and usually I look to see if they have a book background, you know, if they're involved in books, and that makes sense why someone I don't know might want to friend me on Facebook. And I almost hit no, 
because I didn't see any book connection and I was just going through it fast. And then I thought, ah, it won't hurt me to say yes. So I said yes. And then within a second, she DM'd me and said, I'm obsessed with the detective's assistant. Let's talk about making a movie. <laughs> and I was like, bing. <laughs> so I don't know. You know, there's a lot of talk. I think it fits a lot of the zeitgeist right now of, um, you know, capable woman doing the best she can. And, you know. Do you have an ideal uh, actress in mind? Uh, well, I love Jennifer Lawrence, but I, I, you know who I also love is uh, Melissa McCarthy. <laughs> she could do it. Sure. <laughs> really exactly. funny. She's really funny. But, um, you know, it's really fun to think about, but I think there's a lot of talk. Uh, so we'll see. I would not be, I mean, even if it were cartoon characters, <laughs> you know, I'd be fine with anything. So I just think it, it's really cool that people are interested in Kate Warren. So, and I've actually been to the cemetery and touched that gravestone of hers. Sometimes I, uh, we had to go to a funeral recently and, I, and we were in that cemetery and I went over and did my visit to her because, you know, these are real people from history. And I felt like she didn't get, um, her story wasn't appreciated when she was alive. And so I feel like if I can do some small part to sort of resurrect that story uh, and share it with a new generation, then I think that's that's something. And at this point, as a Golden Kite Award winner, you owe her at the very least uh, <laughs> a little bit of uh, deference and respect when you walk by her grave, I would think. <laughs> <Sure>. Absolutely. 